Madam Chancellor, when Mario Molina was a child, he created a makeshift laboratory in his family home to conduct chemistry experiments with a toy microscope. Now, I don't mean to suggest that committing yourself early to science necessarily guarantees the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, which he received in 1995 with two colleagues, but let's just say it certainly doesn't hurt. Because not long after his early embrace of chemistry, Mario Molina co-authored one of the landmark studies of our time. Published in Nature in 1974, while he was still a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Irvine, his research suggested that a class of chemicals, chlorofluorocarbons, once ubiquitous in refrigerators, aerosol spray cans, and solvents, could compromise the ozone layer's ability to block the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. Not only did his work advance our understanding of atmospheric chemistry, it also had a profoundly positive impact on the environment. Those of us here of a certain age surely still have the indelible image of ominous holes growing in the ozone layer over Australia and the poles imprinted in our minds from that time. Mario Molina's work captured the imagination of scientists, the public, and government, and inspired real change in the form of a global ban on CFC emissions. Since then, Dr. Molina has been involved with the chemistry of air pollution of the lower atmosphere and with the science and policy of climate change. He's received more than 30 honorary degrees and his many memberships include the U.S. President's Committee of Advisors in Science and Technology and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences of the Vatican. He's currently a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and president of the Mario Molina Center in Mexico City, where he was born. Madam Chancellor, for his immense contributions to society and to our planet, for reminding us of the power of research to change the world, and for inspiring the type of thinking that has led this university to launch its campus as a living lab of sustainability initiative, I ask you now to confer the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa upon Mario Jose Molina. By authority of the Senate of this university, I confer upon you, Mario Jose Molina, the title and degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. It now gives me great pleasure to ask Dr. Molina to say a few words. Madam Chancellor, President Tu, members of the class of 2011, family and friends of the graduates, distinguished members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored and delighted to receive this honorary degree from the University of British Columbia and to have the opportunity to participate in this ceremony today. It's a great day for all of us. I want to give you a brief personal perspective on a subject that will confront you throughout the next few decades. It's a preservation of the global environment. We have, we have come to recognize only in the past few decades that the impact of human activities on the environment has reached truly global proportions. Of course, also in this past century, there has been enormous progress, particularly in the industrial countries. The quality of life has increased in many ways. To name one, 
the average life expectancy has more than doubled in the past 50 years alone. On the other hand, in the same time period, as you already heard from Madam Chancellor, the population of the world has more than doubled. There are now already 7 billion people in the planet. Now, this increase in population is already having extremely important consequences for the environment, mainly through the depletion of natural resources. I'm sure you're all familiar with many examples, such as the fact that some of the most important ocean fisheries are severely depleted. You're also surely aware that the tropical rainforests have already been reduced to half their original area. Now, the atmosphere is also an essential natural resource of our planet, and it's quite vulnerable. What is being severely affected is its capacity to absorb large quantities of waste products from human activities with serious consequences. We have problems such as air pollution, the degradation of air quality is beginning to reach global proportions because it occurs so often and in so many places. But perhaps the most serious problem that society is facing today concerning environmental issues is climate change, which, as you know, is mainly a consequence of burning fossil fuels and deforestation. There is now a clear consensus among experts that unless society limits emissions of greenhouse gases, the average temperature of the surface of the planet might increase by perhaps four, five, or even more degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The basic science of climate change is indeed very well established. On the other hand, there are, of course, uncertainties in our projections, but there's no doubt that the risk is very significant. The worry is that extreme weather events, such as heat waves, floods, droughts, and so on, that these events could have potentially disastrous consequences for society. Now, there are two compelling reasons to address this problem forcefully, without further delay. The first one is purely economic. It turns out that the most respectable economic studies point out that taking the necessary steps to mitigate climate change would not be very costly. We're talking about 2 or perhaps 3% of global GDP per year. That's a lot of money. But clearly, the cost of the damage would be much greater. The second reason is an ethical one. It would be highly irresponsible for our generation to have a degraded environment for future generations, to leave such an environment for future generations, making it harder for them to enjoy a standard of living such as the one we have today. The conclusion is clear. We must change our view of the world, and we must adopt new ways of thinking so that we can expect a truly satisfactory future for mankind. It is imperative that the industrialized nations work together with the developing nations to offer options for sustained economic growth. But let me add a note of optimism and refer to the issue of the CFCs, these industrial chemicals, and the ozone layer that uh, President Toop already mentioned. These compounds were developed as replacements for toxic refrigerants such as ammonia and sulfur dioxide. And the CFC problem has been essentially solved through an international agreement called the Montreal Protocol. As of 1996, these compounds, these industrial compounds, are no longer being manufactured. And of course, we still have refrigeration, air conditioning, plastic foams, aerosol cans, and so on, but with new uh, CFC3 technologies. We have thus an important precedent that tells us that humanity is indeed capable of solving global environmental problems. Unfortunately, we only have this one particular precedent. Nevertheless, I do believe that we can meet the climate change challenge by working together. Clearly, the world needs the knowledge and expertise that you have acquired here at the University of British Columbia, no matter what your discipline is. It, the world also needs your personal drive and your commitment to work not only for your own personal benefit, but also for the benefit of society and of future generations. You have a tough job ahead of you to deal with the many problems society is facing today. And yet I'm confident that you will succeed. I congratulate each and every one of you 
class of 2011. I wish you the very best of luck in your careers. Thank you.